In 2011, PBS published an article inspired by their frontline documentary, The Confession. This article was titled, A Rare Look at the Police Tactics That Can Lead to False Confessions, which was written by Gretchen Gavitt, who is now an editor for the esteemed Harvard Business Review. This article included quotes from many law enforcement officials, and even journalist Robert Kolker, who you may remember as the author of Lost Girls, a novel I referenced repeatedly throughout the Long Island serial killer episodes. This article was about explaining how exactly false confessions happen. The common sentiment seems to be, if you confessed, you're guilty. But it's actually so much more than that. The human brain is a very fickle thing, and it's very easily tampered with, believe it or not. In almost every story I cover, there comes a point where I mention how flimsy eyewitness testimony actually is. That's because things are very easily misremembered. Even if you are fully sane and aware of your surroundings, a guy that you saw with a red shirt and a blue hat may very easily become a guy wearing a blue shirt and a red hat. Your brain will find a way to play tricks on you. In this PBS article, Gretchen Gavitt pulls many quotes from Robert Kolker and talks about law enforcement interrogation techniques, many of which have gone unchanged for decades. Most law enforcement agencies have been inspired by a 1962 book, Criminal Interrogations and Confessions which went on to create the read technique. The read technique is what you see in almost every single detective movie. A suspect isolated in a dark and dreary interrogation room. A puffy middle-aged detective getting in close and spitting in the suspect's face. Accusing them of things they did. Making up evidence on the fly. Stuff we've seen in every detective movie since the dawn of filmmaking. However, this PBS article goes into how this method, while effective at times, also results in false confessions. The evidence that police will tell the suspect very often makes its way into the confession, thus creating the idea that the suspect knows more than they're letting on. However, this information was just spoon-fed to them moments beforehand, but most prosecutors gloss over that detail. In fact, judges have begun to disallow many of these confessions from being introduced as evidence. The prosecutors have then had to rely on forensic evidence, which may or may not be as damning as a taped confession. You may be asking yourself, how does this tie into the story of the Alcacer girls? Well, in the months after being arrested as an accomplice in the murders of Tony Gomez Rodriguez, Desiree Hernandez Fulch, and Miriam Garcia Ibora, Miguel Ricard claimed that the confessions tied to his name were coerced. Namely, through torture and threats from the law enforcement officials interrogating him. And in Miguel's case, we don't have any publicly available video or audio tapes of him confessing to the crimes. For all we know, the police interrogated him for hours upon hours, threatening to do to his young daughter what had been done to the three Alcazar girls. He would claim that the only real thing from those multiple confessions that belonged to him were his signatures at the bottom of every page. Although Miguel's trial would not begin until nearly half a decade after the three Alcazar victims had been found, the entire case would become a hot-button issue that would divide Spanish citizens down the middle. Those that viewed Miguel as an innocent man framed for a crime he did not commit, and others that believed that he, along with his partner Antonio Anglas, were the worst monsters that Spain had ever seen. This is the continued story of the Alcacer Girls. Welcome to the Unresolved Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Whelan, and this is part four of an ongoing story set in Spain, involving three victims and two suspects, one of whom has never been captured. In part one, I explored the setting of the story, a sleepy little town named Alcacer, located nearby the eastern Spanish coast. I also told you about the victims, 15-year-old Tony Gomez Rodriguez and her two friends, 14-year-olds Desiree Hernandez Fulch and Miriam Garcia Ibora. In part two, I told you about the brief police investigation that followed after the discovery of their bodies. It quickly focused in on a group of suspects. Antonio Angles, a drug dealer with a history of violence who had escaped from prison the year beforehand. And Miguel Ricart, a lowlife who had begun dabbling in drugs and petty crime. 
In part three, I explored the aftermath of the investigation, once Miguel Ricard had been arrested and officially named a suspect. I also told you about Antonio Angles' exploits as he fled from Spain and vanished just off of the Irish coast. Allegedly. His story has never been verified, and his fate remains unknown. Before I get into part 4, in which I will explore the rest of the police investigation and the many confessions of Miguel Ricard, I'd like to briefly let you know how you can support the podcast. I would love to keep bringing stories like this one in a detailed manner, and your support really helps bring that to fruition. If you could, would you mind leaving the podcast a great review on whatever app or website you're listening on? In particular, iTunes, or rather, Apple Podcasts. It would only take a moment of your time, but it would also help the podcast get discovered by other listeners, and perhaps help accomplish my goals of making this a regular weekly broadcast. If you would like to go any further than that, you could head to patreon.com slash unresolvedpod to become a supporter of the show. There, you could get access to some really cool perks to hopefully immerse yourself more into the stories I cover and the podcasting process itself. For those that do choose to support the podcast, thank you so, so much. You can learn more about the podcast, including everything I've just told you, as well as a transcript of each episode and links to whatever I discuss at unresolved.me. Once again, that's unresolved.me. Now, without any further ado, I'll dive back into the story that I've been engrossed with over the past month or so. And that is, of course, the story of the Alcacer Girls. Since the evening of January 27th, Miguel Ricard had been detained by the Spanish Civil Guard and held as a suspect in the murders of the three teenage victims. As I've gone into detail about, he had confessed multiple times. His confessions had taken many twists and turns in each incarnation, sometimes his later confessions completely contradicting what he had testified to previously. More often than that, his confessions seemed to line up with what police had learned from the autopsies of the three victims and the ever-evolving police investigation. None of these interrogations were recorded. No audio or video of any of them were submitted in the criminal proceedings months later. Miguel would claim, later on, that this was due to the confessions being coerced through torture. I've already told you about his first two confessions. When he was first detained, he said that he had nothing to do with the crime and knew nothing about it. Period. Police continued to hold him, and finally worked a confession out of him roughly 24 hours later, at around midnight on January 28th. We have no idea what state he was in at the time, nor what his treatment at the hands of the Spanish Civil Guard had been like. We only know that they had printed out a confession, allegedly taken from the words of Miguel Ricard, that put him with the three Alcacer victims on the night in question. Miguel signed at the bottom of the page, and that was that. 24 hours after that confession, they got another one out of him, adding further credence to the story that the autopsies were painting, that the three girls had been abducted, raped, tortured, and murdered. Police had been unprepared to follow through on Miguel's confessions, especially when he put most of the blame on another suspect, Antonio Angles. Police would spend the next month claiming to be hot on Antonio's trail, but in March of 1993, he seemingly vanished forever, disappearing in the waters off the coast of Ireland. However, some believe that Antonio disappeared long before that. He had escaped from prison in March of 1992, a year beforehand, and police had not even signed a warrant for his recapture until September of that year. Conspiracy theorists claim that Antonio had been long gone by the time the three Alcacer girls went missing, and the only proof to verify he fled the country when Spanish police claim he did is eyewitness testimony. Miguel Ricard gave a much more detailed confession on March 2nd, 1993, in which he filled in many details that police had been lacking up until that point. He told police that the plan to abduct some girls had been inspired by Antonio's hatred of women, and he had voiced this ambition months in advance. Apparently, Antonio had made obscene, offhand comments about his desire to murder young girls. So now, it was made clear to the chief prosecutor that Miguel and Antonio had set out to commit these heinous crimes when they departed their home in Cotaroya on November 13, 1992. 
In this confession, Miguel also clarified what weapon it was that the men had taken with them, a 9mm pistol that Antonio had obtained illegally and used in a series of robberies. Instead of the weapon being an abstract concept, used loosely to describe the vague killing of the three girls, it was now an untraceable weapon tied to other violent crimes. During this March 2nd confession, Miguel gave a more detailed summary of the assaults on the three girls, which apparently took place in the abandoned ruins nearby where the bodies were discovered. You can view photos and videos of these abandoned houses online, which look haunting enough without imagining this nightmare taking place there. It is important to note that during this confession, cracks began to be noticed in the story that Miguel's confessions had concocted. You see, word had reached police, during their exhaustive investigation, that Miguel had somewhat of an alibi for the night in question. On November 13th, 1992, Miguel had been spotted at a bar getting dinner with another man. So, this story made its way into Miguel's third confession. He states that after helping Antonio abduct the three girls and taking them to La Romana, that he was present for the brutal rape and abuse of the three girls. During this time period, the three girls were bound and raped, not only by Antonio, but by Miguel, who was forced to by Antonio at gunpoint. When Miguel wasn't able to perform adequately, Antonio apparently used a stick to abuse the other victims. Then, Miguel describes him and Antonio just getting up and leaving to visit the nearby town of Catadao. There, they visited an establishment known as El Parador, a restaurant and bar, where they got some snacks and drinks before returning to the ruins of La Romana, where the girls were still bound and captive. He describes only one of the girls refusing something to drink, before the abuse continued at the hands of Antonio Anglas. The evening ended with Miguel and Antonio using a pickaxe and a hoe to dig the hole in which the three victims were buried. The inclusion of the bar Miguel claimed to have gone to on the night in question proposed an interesting notion for the chief prosecutor of the case, Enrique Beltran. First off, the bar was called El Perador and happened to be in the town called Catadao. This town is roughly halfway between La Romana and Picasent, where the girls had gone missing. So it was basically a double-edged sword. By Miguel's own confession, it placed him physically closer to the burial ground of the three Alcacer girls but it also muddled the timeline significantly. Especially since Miguel claimed to have been at the restaurant before the girls would have feasibly been murdered. You see, the abuse suffered by the three victims had shown the forensic teams that they had suffered for a period of time before their murders. Hours, definitely, but perhaps even days. They did not die just an hour or two after disappearing, that much was certain. Police reached out to the owner of El Parador, who recognized Miguel and testified that he had gone there frequently in the summer of 1992, sometimes with a partner in tow. Police speculated this was Antonio, but it also could have been any of the Anglas brothers. At the time of the investigation, the owner was not willing to go on the record to state that Miguel had been at El Parador on the night in question. We were now roughly three months removed from the night that the girls had gone missing so I can't really blame the owner for refusing to make such a definitive statement. This would become an official part of the story moving forward, that Miguel and Antonio had gone to fetch bar snacks after abducting the three girls, and before returning to finish what they had started. When Miguel Ricard's trial would begin, years later, the owner of El Parador made a much more definitive statement. He claimed that Miguel Ricard had definitely come in on a Friday to purchase a couple of sandwiches, a salad, and a drink all of which was taken to go. This was sometime between 11pm and midnight. However, the owner of the bar did not recall seeing anyone with Miguel. That meant no Antonio, no other Anglas brother, no one. The bar owner's wife, 
who was also working at El Parador on that fateful Friday the 13th, claimed that a man was with Miguel that night, and that that man was none other than Antonio Anglas. When Miguel would finally stand trial in 1997, neither the bar owner nor his wife would be present to testify. The cause of this can perhaps be when the bar owner stated that his signature was forged on a police document. The document in question was a signed statement in which the bar owner had apparently testified to Miguel Ricard's presence at his bar on the night in question. Now that I've told you about the bar that Miguel apparently went to on November 13th, 1992, I think it's fair that I talk briefly about the location where the bodies of the three teenage victims were found. I have identified this place as La Romana, which I should clarify just a little bit. I incorrectly stated in part one of the series that this was a small town called La Romana, which is about two hours south of where the girls went missing. However, the place where the girls were found was named La Romana, but it isn't located nearby the town of the same name and is only 30 or so minutes away from Picasent. Where they were found, La Romana, also known as House of the Roman, is a wild, unkempt area wedged between Catadao, the small town that housed the bar El Parador, and the Taos Dam. So, apologies on the mistake there. To be fair, it's pretty easy to confuse a geographical location for a town of the same name just an hour or so away. The La Romana location where the girls were found is even more desolate than the small town I mentioned in part one. For starters, there isn't even really a town for miles. Catadao is the most notable, and that has a population of less than 3,000 in modern times, much less so in the early 1990s. If you'd like to see what the area looks like, just quickly Google search Barranco de la Romana and check it out. The area is wild, desolate nothingness. Just rolling hills, vegetation, and dirt for miles and miles. One thing you'll notice from the photographs is that there are a lot of dirt roads. Many Google Maps images of the area were captured in 2008, and even then, there were not any noticeable differences from the photos taken of the area in 1993. There's not a street light or paved road in sight. If you remember what I told you in the first episode of the series, you might remember that I told you about the two men that discovered the bodies. Middle-aged beekeepers who happened upon the bodies by chance after hiking around their property. Well, the abandoned farmhouse where the girls were supposedly tortured was not too far from the road, just a few hundred meters. But the area where the girls were buried was over a kilometer away. And the walkway to get there, treacherous and difficult, was steep and almost impossible to navigate in the dark. Doubly so if you were given the task of carrying or guiding three fully grown victims. Even if the Alcacer girls were alive on the trip out there, the forensic teams at the crime scene had failed to locate any blood or murder weapons. This is a glaring flaw with the case that exists to this day. The prosecution took Miguel at his word, that the girls had been tortured, raped, and murdered. However, the details he provided about those crimes were incredibly lacking. They were now more than three full-length detailed confessions into this case file, and they had no murder weapons, no crime scene, no rational motive, no forensic evidence, or any valid explanations for any of those absences. Sadly, though, that would not change anytime soon. Up until this point, two names have kept appearing on almost all of the sources I have used to make these episodes. 
The first is Enrique Beltran, the chief prosecutor from Alcacer who is responsible for coordinating the case against Miguel Ricard. The other is Dr. Francisco Ross Plaza, a name I have mentioned before in the series. Dr. Ross was one of the forensic experts present throughout the case, taking on the role of acting forensic doctor in the absence of his superior. His superior, Dr. Fernando Verdu, eventually returned from his leave, but Dr. Ross remained the forensic lead on the case. Dr. Ross led the first autopsy of the victims, which I detailed back in parts 2 and 3 of the series. This autopsy was, to put it lightly, poorly performed. Body parts were unnecessarily amputated, forensic evidence was washed away, and multiple hairs from all three bodies were collected in one container, which made it a bit of a DNA nightmare later on. The second autopsy, performed a day later by noted professor Dr. Luis Frontella Carreras, made excessive notes of many of these errors. Well, it comes as no surprise to learn that Dr. Francisco Ross Plaza did not agree with many of those assertions, and also refused to work with Dr. Luis Frontella during his second autopsy and the subsequent reporting process. I really don't mean for this section to be a smear piece on Dr. Ross. I don't. But at one point you have to be a professional and not let personal issues get in your way. Because not only was the first autopsy a nightmare, but Dr. Ross's name is all over the case file of the murdered Alcacer girls including the many confessions of Miguel Ricard. Throughout the first three confessions Miguel Ricard made, Dr. Francisco Ross Plaza was the presiding forensics officer. His name, along with that of Chief Prosecutor Enrique Beltran, is all over the case file. So, besides presiding over an autopsy that many experts deemed to be poorly performed, Dr. Ross was present throughout many confessions that Miguel Ricard claims were coerced. And if that wasn't enough, Physical and mental evaluations were performed on Miguel Ricard before his trial could proceed. I'll give you a quick guess as to who presided over those. Even if Miguel Ricard had been tortured throughout the interrogation process, there was only one man that could verify it. The very same man that had been present during all of said confessions, Dr. Francisco Ross Plaza. Are you beginning to see what I mean when I talk about this case being so poorly handled? Even if Dr. Francisco Ross Plaza was an infallible being, I'd have a hard time believing that one man could be counted upon to handle every forensic aspect of a multifaceted murder investigation. Yet everywhere you look, Dr. Rose's name appears. He was responsible for conducting the autopsies. He was present throughout most of the confessions, at least the ones where Miguel Ricard confessed his guilt, and was the person responsible for writing up a mental and physical evaluation of the suspect, including treating any of his wounds or ailments. At the very least, Dr. Francisco Ross Plaza's involvement in the case is one giant conflict of interest. On March 29, 1993, Miguel Ricard threw a curveball into the prosecution's case. In an inquiry made by the judge in charge of the case, Miguel asserted that all of his prior signed statements were untrue. He told the judge that he had had nothing to do with the crime that he only identified the three victims from images on television, and that he had originally remained silent because of other illegal acts he had committed. Miguel gave a detailed alibi for November 13, 1992. Apparently, a few days beforehand, Miguel had robbed a small bank alongside two of the other Anglos brothers, Mauricio and Antonio. No one had been harmed or injured, but they had used a pistol which belonged to Antonio. Three days later, on the Friday in question, they had been shopping, visiting restaurants and bars, and spending time with friends of theirs, aided by their recent robbery payday. This is where Miguel began to make claims of coerced confessions, which he would carry on throughout the trial. This must have made some kind of impact, because Miguel Ricard would not make another confession or statement for nearly six months, at which point it was simply back to business as usual. On September 3, 1993, Miguel Ricard confessed his crimes once again. At this point, Antonio Inglis was long gone. He had supposedly disappeared off the Irish coast months ago, so Miguel had no issue blaming Antonio for all of the crimes once again. During this confession, Miguel Ricard once again became a burdened spectator to the crimes, 
he apparently did not see Antonio rape or torture any of the girls, but he allegedly witnessed Antonio shoot one of them inside the pit. Which, of course, fit perfectly with what the second autopsy had discovered. I've told you frequently that the first autopsy of the victims was terribly done. Well, one important detail that I failed to mention is that the forensic squad behind that autopsy missed a vital clue. That clue being a bullet discovered in the hand of one of the victims. That's right, the autopsy missed an entire bullet. Dr. Luis Frontella Carreras was the one who discovered this bullet during his second autopsy. Of course, since only one bullet was discovered during the autopsy process, now Miguel's confession had worked to include the origins of that one bullet. Details continued to shift throughout these confessions. He had gone from no involvement, to having sex with the victim, to participating in the rapes and assaults, to now knowing nothing other than Antonio had raped and killed all three of them. Another major change came from the brief inclusion of two entirely new suspects, who apparently participated in the crimes with Antonio and Miguel. One of these other suspects was Antonio's brother, Mauricio Angles, and the other was a teenaged friend of Antonio's nicknamed El Nano. I'm sure you all have many questions, but Miguel himself would offer up more details in one final confession, which happened to be made over a year later in 1994. On September 30th, 1994, Miguel offered up many more details about the crime in his final, definitive statement. Despite all of the issues his prior confessions had caused, including shifting details and Miguel's own disassociation of the crime on various occasions, this would become the official narrative moving forward. Miguel stated that Antonio had made odd comments in the weeks before November 13th, 1992. He had talked about abducting and raping some girls, which Miguel thought was just part of a weird sense of humor. That evening, Miguel was riding around with Antonio in a white Opal Corsa, alongside two other young men. Like I mentioned, one was Antonio's brother, Mauricio, and the other was a young teenager who was roughly 15 years old and nicknamed El Nano. Miguel claimed to not know the name of this young man, only that he was a friend of Antonio's and was possibly involved in drug dealing. According to this confession, Antonio was driving the white sedan, while Miguel was in the passenger seat and the other two men were in the back seat. They drove the 10 kilometers from Cataroya to Picasent, scouring for young women nearby the local nightclubs and discotheques. When they picked up the three young girls, just down the block from the Kalur nightclub, they had done so under the guise of dropping them off at the entrance of the club. The girls apparently got in the car willingly, although one has to wonder how three teenage girls could fit into a two-door white sedan that already had four full-grown men inside. But apparently these four men drove the girls out to the La Romana farmhouse, with Miguel under the intoxication of drugs and alcohol. When they arrived at the abandoned farmhouse, things became a bit blurrier for Miguel. He claimed not to participate in the assaults or the murders of the three girls, although Antonio, Mauricio, and the unknown El Nano all did. Finally, Miguel heard the sound of three gunshots in the distance, which triggered him alert. Shortly thereafter, Antonio arrived at the car, angry at Miguel for not participating. He tried to assault Miguel, before Mauricio came to break things up. Then, Antonio, at gunpoint, forced Miguel to help him dig the pit, in which the three Alcacer victims were eventually buried. These confessions, while full of inconsistencies and changes, basically formed the bedrock of the entire police investigation. At this point, nearing the end of 1993, police still lacked some pretty major parts of the investigation. They had no murder weapon, no forensic evidence tying Miguel to the victims in any way, no crime scene, and a motive that stemmed from another suspect who was believed to be missing and or dead, loosely hating women. The case, in other words, was just a mess and it was not helped by the fact that many of the people involved in the prosecution, namely Chief Prosecutor Enrique Beltran and forensic expert Dr. Francisco Ross Plaza, were seemingly in over their heads. 
they had never been involved in such a huge, exhaustive criminal case, and they now found themselves clinging to the one piece of the puzzle that they had, which was, of course, Miguel Ricard. Sadly, things would not change. Despite forensic technology leaping forward in the coming years, the prosecution would fail to establish any physical link between Miguel and the three victims. There wasn't a fingerprint, a drop of any bodily fluid, a hair follicle, nothing. To this day, no physical evidence has ever been established to put Miguel Ricard either with the victims or at the alleged crime scene. The trial to decide Miguel Ricard's guilt or innocence would not begin until 1997, but even then, that would not be the end of the story. To be concluded on the next episode of the Unresolved Podcast. Thank you.